Hello everybody and welcome to our lecture on Germany's role in the Euro crisis. Some say Germany's role is to destroy Europe. Here you see Tuesday, November 26, a, a, a round table in London with the title Angela Merkel is destroying Europe. And there were two parties with two arguments on Angela Merkel's, that is, Germany's role. The one position is they are calling her the devil. Inflammatory words, no doubt, but Europe has every reason to Merkel is causing needless pain and hardship across Europe. In southern states in particular, the austerity measures she insists that nations like Greece and Portugal adopt are strangling their economies, creating huge unemployment and making it impossible for them to pay off their debts. The very reason for introducing these measures in the first place. Worse still, even so the IMF and the US are beseeching her to give Europe a desperately needed boost by opening up Germany's economy. She refuses to do so. The plan in Germany now is to run a budget surplus. It's madness and it's wrong. Is this Germany's role in the Euro crisis? Or is Germany's role represented here by the second position, saying that line is becoming the increasingly orthodox take on the crisis in Europe. But is it fair? Is it true? Isn't this just another case of scapegoating Germany for being Europe's largest and best-run economy? If Germany now enjoys an unemployment rate of only 5.3%, compared to Europe's average of 12%. That's because of the past 15 years. In this time, it kept real wages down and experienced low rate, rates of growth, while in the other nations of the Eurozone, wages soared and their economies boomed. They recklessly disregarded the rules the crisis countries, the rules on fiscal discipline to which they signed up on joining the Euro, the Maastricht criteria, as they are called. They cocked two fingers at Berlin when it warned them what would happen. And now that it has happened, it is all Germany's fault. Question mark. Angela Merkel isn't destroying Europe. She's one of the few elements that is keeping it together. So we have these two positions diametrically opposing each other and we hope to get a serious cause and an understanding of what, what's, what's really happening. The first point I want to make is to ask whether Germany is really rich. Is it a rich country? I'd say no. Germany, people think Germany is rich because it's big, it's productive, but per capita, Germany is not among the richest countries. It's middle ground. Luxembourg 
has a national income of 83,000 euros per year. So if they distribute their wealth, their income, national income per year, evenly every citizen would get 83,000 euros. In Germany, it's 33,000, 50,000 less. Look at Denmark, Sweden, Austria, Netherlands, Finland, Ireland, Belgium. In the last class, we saw that Belgium was a sick man of Europe three decades ago. It's now per capita richer than Germany. So the economic weight Germany has is not due to its wealth per capita, but due to the fact that Germany is the biggest economy in Europe, 80 million. This is Germany's fate. And we have heard in the, in the arguments on its role that Germany enjoys or suffers wage restraint. German workers don't, uh, 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 wages did not raise as steeply as they did in Italy or Spain during the last decades. And look at Greece. Oh, Greece has a national income per capita uh, lower than Germany's, but it's not, it's in the middle field still. So I think we should forget this uh, widespread belief that Germany is a rich country and German taxpayers could easily afford to help other European countries. They can do, they can give away something, but it's also a, they, it's a sacrifice. I mean, it's not just that they have as many as the citizens of Luxembourg, Denmark, and Sweden on average. So now, what is the structure of the class today? It's on Germany's role in the crisis. So what I did up to now are preliminary remarks. Now we come to the structured lecture. We talk about the political economy of Germany first. That is, what are the governance, what, what is the governance system, how is it structured? What, what kind of capitalism do we have in Germany? You know, we have varieties of capitalism, and the German one is a very special variety of capitalism. Then we are going to talk about the features of the political system, and we will also look at the po opinion po polls and uh, try to get an impression what the pop public opinion is in Germany on the euro and the euro crisis. And last not least, we will look at German politics and policies towards the concepts and strategies to solve the crisis. What is a German recipe to solve it? So let us start with the political economy of Germany. As you may know, Germany is called a social market economy. That is, it's not a liberal, neoliberal market economy, as in the United States or Britain, after Maggie Thatcher at least. It's an, it's, the economy is not just on production and consumption is also on, re, it, it, it cares for redistribution. Distributive aspects are strong and even embedded in the German constitution. That's what we call Sozialstaatsgebot, social state 
a German, Germany is a, a social state. And it's, you can find it in the Constitution. It cares for the weak. Then uh, another feature you might, may have heard of is the dual apprenticeship system and master craftsman diploma. That means that in Germany, part of the German education is a dual education after the junior high school. If you do not go to university, you get a job in a company, work there three weeks as an apprentice in jobs like plumber, electrician, mechanic, baker, trader, and so on. And in the next three weeks, or in the first half of a week, and the second half of a week, uh, you have to go to a professional school, Berufsschule, for learning the theoretic surroundings of your profession. After these three years, you can study further in this ref uh, profession to require uh, uh, to get a master diploma, Meisterbrief. Then you can run your own firm and educate others. You can't do that unless you got this master diploma. But you can, if you don't want to go for the master diploma, you can also go to a university and study a more theoretical topic there. So an electrician learns not only that what is, its company is doing, he learns what an electrician has to know on a rather high uh, level of knowledge. This is one, I think, uh, one of the secrets of uh, German success in industrial production and also in uh, everyday artisan uh, establishments. Now another feature is this industrial co-determination. Since 1952, that is long ago, there is, we have uh, co-determination on the workplace and company level. That means that workers have a say in company matters. And in some big companies, there's even a parity principle where the board seats are the half of the, have, have the workers and the other half have the owners. So this is not a shareholder system, it's also a stakeholder system. The third characteristic is a three-pillar banking system. They are not only the private big banks, they are also communal banks, they're called Sparkassen, savings banks. The owners of the sav these savings banks are the cities, so it's public in a way. And there are the cooperative banks. The cooperative banking sector is quite important in Germany, and they lend money to medium-sized and small-sized firms. And in contrast to the big private banks, these cooperatives survive the crisis very well, because they are not so globalized. They work in a national environment and uh, are not aff afflicted. Then we have associational self-regulation, inter private interest governments, collective bargaining autonomy, and in the whole you could say this is a coordinated social market economy, not a liberal or neoliberal market economy. Features of the political system, very short because we are already running out of time. It's a bicameral federalist system with 16 constitutional states, one federal state, and the 16 states have full qualities of statehood. There's a lot of non-majoritarian governments, 
non majoritarian politics. This is due to veto structures. There are many power holders in the political system, and there is a lot of consensual power sharing. There's a powerful constitutional court. There are always coalition governments because uh, single party governments are not, almost not possible on the basis of our electoral laws. And there's local autonomy and self government. In some, there are many veto players, slow decision making, and the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, is constitutionally much weaker than most other heads of government. Because he has always, she has always to negotiate with other power holders, constitutional court, with the, with the federal state, uh, with the constitutional states, with a powerful constitutional court and, and uh, strong parties. So, next. What is Germany's strategy in the crisis? I think four points are worth to be mentioned. The first is German, the German government and almost all par relevant parties are in favor of stricter controls of financial markets. That is, they are in favor of financial transaction taxes, stricter banking regulation, and such things. They are also in favor of conditional budget supports for their Euro partners. That means, provided that recipient countries implement structural reform programs to strengthen their economic competitiveness, Germany is prepared to support such reform policies. By the way, the same reform policy, policies Germany applied and in part suffered from 10 years ago and succeeded. Then another strategy is a constitutional debt limit. The constitution now has an article saying that additional government expenditures require additional tax revenues. So the abilities to borrow are restricted, very much restricted, constitutionally restricted. So you can change it only with a two-thirds majority in the parliament. Then a uh, fourth point is a reference to the so-called Agenda 2010 austerity measures beginning in the year 2000, I already mentioned. This was a program of internal devaluation, cutting of wages, cutting of social benefits uh, in the same way as Germany is now calling other countries to do. Now, what does it mean? The first point, stricter controls of financial markets. That means that Germany is inclined to break the power of financial markets. So the idea is that financial markets are driving politics. They are, they are uh, more powerful than governments. And this power of private financial markets and actors, hedge functions and so on, traders, has to be restricted. Then conditional budget support. This is the idea not just to help, but to help in order to restore the competitiveness of crisis countries. This is the idea. I don't uh, say anything on whether this will be successful. I mean, this is just the idea. I'm reporting what the German government intends to do and what their perspective of the crisis is. So don't confuse and say, Professor is telling us that uh, we should do this or that. I'm just reporting what the German government's idea of a possible solution could be. 
Then constitutional debt limit, of course. This is this has been introduced in order to put a stop on irresponsible public spending. A constitutional stop. This is what the first position in the statements we, this, we saw before said, this is, this is a devil, because they will force us uh, to stop spending more than we can afford. Then, what does the reference to the so-called Agenda 2010 means? It means cutting public spending, labor costs, and social benefits. The Germans did it, and the population accepted it. Uh, not uh, voluntarily, there were many protests, but a uh, Labour Party, the Social Democratic Party, did it, not the Conservatives. These were austerity, me austerity measures resulting in an internal devaluation. In the face of the euro, because external devaluation is no longer possible, because Germany, as all other participants of the euro, have no, are no longer sovereign enough to govern their own currency. So they depend on the European Central Bank and their stability policies in the same way as other Euro countries. And they also are bound to the Maastricht criteria of budgetary discipline. And they, a, this is a special story we cannot uh, go into here. Uh, we cannot dwell into this. Uh, after unification, Germany also heard the Maastricht criteria in a special case, and I think in the future, in special cases, natural disasters, earthquakes or so, of course, they would uh, not insist on these principles. Of course, if you have a major disaster, you must borrow money in order to rebuild. But not uh, not as a reward for bad governance. These are the measures and the principles behind them. Here you see from 1970 onwards the development of wages, just a short point, you see that Germany always experienced very moderate wage increases, whereas Italy, the United Kingdom, particularly Italy, Italy's compensation of employees uh, rose steeply and maybe deteriorated there. Uh, oh, what is this? This is uh, wrong here. Yeah, this is, uh, this is bad construction of the... Now I must go here and, um, and change something because this is not... Something is wrong here. Well, I made a mistake here. How can I correct this? Let's get rid of this. So, yeah, last point. The public opinion in the euro crisis. There is a mental mentality I would call the Swabian housewife syndrome. You may have heard that Angela Merkel said that her politics follows the principles of the Swabian housewife. So the Swabians in Germany are the thrifty people. So thrifty that some say these are originally Scotsmen who were expelled from their country because of being too thrifty. 
Thrifty or Guides, was heißt Guides? To hmm? huh? frugal. frugal, yes, frugal. You can also say frugal, yeah. They save a lot, don't spend. This is a historical experience, not rooted as in the Netherlands, for instance, in a Calvinist, uh, a Protestant ethics, work ethics. You may have heard of Max Weber, the Protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism. In this case, Southwest Germany, in Swabia, it's the experience of extreme poverty in the 18th, 19th uh, century. And uh, so the, well, what does the Swabian housewife syndrome mean? I have a movie here. I can show you. It's on also from YouTube. Yeah, I must... Gerlingen, with a population of almost 20,000, is one of the wealthiest towns in Baden-Württemberg. That's allegedly because the people here economize. Altogether, they have a disposable income of half a billion euros. But you won't find many luxury boutiques here. Swabians are famous for their thrift. Is there any truth to the cliché? We ask at the local history museum. They say the Swabians have money, and they do spend it on things, like a fur coat, for instance. But they'll wear the fur on the inside, not the outside, so no one sees it. <laughs> Here at the museum, we meet up with so a typical we, we, Swabian we part of it stands for because investment. it's true, I mean, women in, in, in this region, uh, they, uh, they clean the streets on Saturdays. Now, we will have a, an opinion from a banker and from a butcher. And you will see that even the Germans flee the euro and the rich one wants invest in Norwegian krona or Australian money. Almost every day we talk to people who are frightened. More and more we're seeing people fleeing the euro currency, moving their assets into Norwegian kroner or Australian dollars. And this trend is on the rise. But when the going gets tough, Gerlingen gets going. The owner of the town's largest butchers shows us his latest major investment, a meat drying machine. People here are willing to try new things as long as they stay within their budget. With typical Swabian discretion, we won't say how much it costs. I think it's very Swabian to think about what's possible, more or less, within the limits of your means, about what you can afford, so you don't plan things beyond your means. I think that's extremely important. He has four shops and employs 50 workers. That qualifies as a mid-sized business. What advice would he have for EU members struggling with debt? When I notice things aren't going well for us, I have to think about why that's so, and then I have to tackle the problem. So I still say assistance, yes, but you have to have the will to get things up and running again yourself. I say that with a view to the southern European countries. So is he worried about his savings? Not really. We've put a lot into the business, so there's not much left in savings. <laughs> what else would a typical Swabian say? The philosophy behind the Swabian housewife dates from the 19th century when people had much less. So it seems a penny saved is a euro earned, ultimately. Yeah. The Swabian housewife syndrome, we got an impression, I mean this is also some myth in it, and, uh, uh, but, uh, but in the, there is something real in it. People have an attitude of not showing luxury, luxurious consumption. They don't show that they are rich. So people say, 
To be rich means to be hidden rich, not to show what they have, and they save. This also characterizes, I think, uh, taxpayers' attitudes. Taxpayers expect services for paying taxes, not just paying taxes for luxury consumption of the government. They want to have public services, and if public services are good, old-age nursing home, uh, 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 homes, uh, university education, uh, sewage systems, they uh, are prepared to be taxed. There is uh, another point, is the dominance of middle-class attitudes and medium-sized enterprises. So most foreigners think Germany is a country of big firms, Volkswagen or BMW or so, but it's not true. Most of the jobs and most of the incomes is based on small and medium-sized firms. And particularly, these firms are inclined to these work-related values. And now I must go back because this is, is a mis misconstruction here. I must have an, I, I got to go into it again. And uh, this all together you could characterize this way. It's a welfare model based on work-related values favoring distributive justice, austeri austerity over growth, and saving over spending. Now, the question is, is that wrong? I mean, if you know, all right, if you know Keynesian policies, the Keynesian concept of crisis solutions, this is contrary to Keynesianism, because Keynes says if you are in a crisis, you must spend, you must borrow and spend in order to get the economy running. And uh, those who oppose the German strategy refer to a Keynesian position. So I don't say this is right. It's just this is the, the mental and the practical and the strategic direction of politics. I don't say it's right or wrong, but this is what directs policy making. Now, uh, this is again, this again, ah yeah, here. What do you think Germans think about the euro, whether it's good or bad? Astonishingly, more and more Germans enjoy the euro. Asked whether they would like to have the Deutsche Mark back from 2008 onwards, when the financial crisis started, the Germans liked the euro more and more. So the question is why? We don't have the time to discuss this, but maybe in your discussions of the lecture, you can come back to this question. Why do the Germans like the euro now more than before? This has to do, just a hint, also something with the generational effect. And uh, it's not just a uh, a consequence of German uh, German pride, or, or that they see the euro as a as a means to uh, govern Europe. Uh, it's right. Germany is has become a kind of an accidental empire. They didn't like to come into this role, but they came, and they fear even this role. Now to, to the end, I come to the end, and I will show you, I, I told you that in Swabia, uh, where the car was invented by Carl Benz, uh, mechanical engineering started 250, 300 years ago with a cuckoo clock. The peasants in the black forest in severe winters when they had to stay at home, started to build 
things like that. This one is from 1760, a cuckoo clock. So every hour the cuckoo comes out and signals that the hour is over. And they did it from wood. They cut trees and did it. And they got fine mechanical knowledge. And then they even built, this is even older, they built organs, machines to produce sounds, the cuckoo sound. The cuckoo clock is not a, a simple thing. And this is a, are the first steps towards sophisticated mechanical engineering. Um, yeah, I, now we are at the end. I hope you enjoyed it and you have a lot of uh, uh, new ideas to discuss and have a good time.